Hello, I'm Sharon Best. Welcome to APP to APP Virtual Lectures. I'm a neurology PA. I work at the Penn Memory Center at the University of Pennsylvania. We specialize in seeing patients with cognitive complaints. I work with an amazing team and I want to thank them for everything they've taught me over the last couple of years. Today's lecture is Imaging for Dementia with Clinical Cases. So we'll cover four objectives, the purpose of imaging for patients with cognitive complaints, we'll teach you how to recognize the most common dementia diagnoses, and we'll help you differentiate between the four functional cognitive systems. And we'll also help you recognize MRI and PET imaging that correlates with the different types of dementias. So the purpose of imaging for patients with cognitive complaints. Most of you know that that our primary reason for doing the MRI is really to rule out structural causes like tumors, strokes, bleeds, or inflammatory processes. Hopefully a normal pressure hydrocephalus would jump out at you. It has a pretty striking ventriculomegaly and the patient has a triad, may have the full triad of symptoms being decrease in cognition, urinary incontinence, and a classic magnetic gait. So MRIs are also helpful to increase or decrease our suspicion for neurodegenerative diseases by showing us patterns of regional atrophy. And those patterns often point to underlying specific pathology. So by that, I mean, for Alzheimer's disease, we generally have a medial temporal lobe and a posterior parietal cortical atrophy in greater proportion to the rest of the cortex. At and the underlying pathology that that's pointing to is amyloid plaques and tau tangles. In contrast to uh, another type of dementia called semantic, semantic variant PPA, we have a classic MRI finding of an anterior temporal polar atrophy with left greater than right. And that typically points to an underlying pathology of TDP43, a whole other type of protein. So ultimately, we're going to ask ourselves two questions. Does the imaging correlate with the patient's clinical syndrome and does the neuropsychological testing or the cognitive testing that we're doing also match? So you can think of it as a puzzle with the biggest piece of the puzzle being the clinical interview. And the MRI and the cognitive testing are smaller pieces to that puzzle. Now, we also wanna make sure that the patient is, is not really the problem is not an underlying psychiatric or metabolic cause of the impairment in cognition. So here's seven diagnoses that we'll talk about tonight, and they're color coded for you to match with this proteinopathy key. So as mentioned, Alzheimer's disease would have an underlying proteinopathy of amyloid plaques and tau tangles. And we would expect that the primary deficits are in memory and learning. Now there's a variant of Alzheimer's disease called posterior cortical atrophy, and hence its name, the posterior cortex, typically the uh, dorsal parietal or parietal occipital cortex is most impaired at the beginning of the disease. So oftentimes memory is spared and the patient will present with visuospatial problems. Now, in contrast to another type of dementia that's also driven by amyloid plaques and tau tangles, we have a local penic primary progressive aphasia. So all three of the primary progressive aphasias, local penic, semantic, and agrammatic, will all have language as the primary presenting problem, and it will be the most prominent problem the patient is having. And oftentimes in the beginning of the disease, memory is spared for all three. But as you can see, all three are different colors. So with the logopenic, most often it's Alzheimer's disease that's driving it. So the underlying proteinopathy, again, is amyloid plaques and tau tangles. Whereas I've already mentioned with a semantic primary progressive aphasia, most often the underlying proteinopathy is TDP43. And then we have the agrammatic non-fluent primary progressive aphasia that has different types of telepathy usually driving the problem. Now, we're also going to discuss the behavioral variant FTD. So the underlying proteinopathy is typically, again, various types of telepathies, but this patient's going to present with primarily behavioral problems and change in personality. 
On testing, we may see um, deficits in attention and executive functioning. Now, finally, a Lewy body's dementia, you're probably most familiar with, will present with visual spatial problems. We also typically have Parkinsonian signs and symptoms and hallucinations very early in the, in the disease course. So the underlying protein for dementia fluid bodies is alpha-synuclein. Now we're going to be thinking about four functional cognitive systems when you're interviewing your patient, and you're going to try to fit him into one of these four. Obviously patients won't fit perfectly, but if you, can, if you can identify the primary functional cognitive system, you can often narrow down your differentials. So first we have a medial temporal limbic network where memory and learning will be the primary problems reported and primary problems showing up on the cognitive testing. And as we mentioned, this would be most likely driven by an, an Alzheimer's dementia or an MCI with an AD etiology. We also have a second functional cognitive system that we call occipital temporal or occipital parietal network. And in here, the patient will present more with visual spatial problems or object recognition. And it's because of the area of the brain affected. So occipital parietal or occipital temporal. So this you remember is a vision area. And so generally speaking, we can narrow down those two diagnoses to either a posterior cortical atrophy or a dementia of Lewy bodies. Now we also have a frontal temporal network where behavior is often most prominent. And on testing, we'll see deficits in executive and attention. So we have a behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia, and there's also another variant of Alzheimer's disease called the behavior variant of Alzheimer's disease. Now, finally, we have the perisylvian language network. So remember the sylvian fissure, dividing the temporal lobe from the frontal and parietal lobes. So they're saying it's around the sylvian fissure. So we have the logopenic that generally is in this area, which is a superior temporal and a posterior parietal. And then we also have the semantic variant PPA that's generally that anterior polar temporal atrophy. And then we have the agromatic that's often in the inferior lateral frontal area. So now we'll do our first clinical vignette. So we have a 58 year old right-handed female who presents with memory problems for 1.5 years. She has 20 years education. She has a PhD in immunology and she worked 25 years as an infectious disease researcher. She retired due to quote, an inability to perform her duties. So per her husband, now as I read the, as I read the history, the husband's giving, you wanna to try to fit this patient into one of these four functional cognitive systems. Okay, so she's fairly, fairly accurate recalling details of recent events. She endorses some word finding problems, mostly recalling proper names of celebrities she used to know. She used to be an avid reader, but now she hardly reads at all. She complains of difficulty reading. She's had optometry and ophthalmology evals that have been unsuccessful in procuring effective reading glasses after multiple attempts. Her handwriting is significantly deteriorated and she has problems with buttons and zippers when dressing. She's had a few fender benders um, driving and she says she's a little confused navigating. She's had two falls in the last six months, one going down a curb and the second going down steps. She cooks recipes mostly that she can recall spontaneously. She does the laundry, she cleans the house, not as well. And the husband has to had to take over managing the finances. So let's take a look. So the first Zoom polling question is, which of the four main functional cognitive systems would be most affected in this patient? And you can choose from the one to four here on the right. So perhaps you said occipital temporal, occipital parietal. Looking back at our patient, oops, looking back, she's having problems reading. She can't see. She's been to optometry and ophthalmology. She's having fender benders, probably because she can't see when she's driving. She's had a couple of falls. It looks like she might have trouble seeing the curves. 
Now, maybe she's not doing the finances because she can't see the detail. So which, which would be your top differential diagnoses? Alzheimer's disease, posterior cortical atrophy, local panic variant PPA, semantic PPA, or dementia of Lewy bodies. So you can knock out your PPAs because the primary symptom there should be language. And Alzheimer's disease, the primary symptom should be memory and learning, and she's really not having trouble recalling recent events. So we're down to posterior cortical atrophy or dementia of Lewy bodies. So let's take a look at her physical exam. So this poll should be posterior cortical atrophy or dementia of Lewy bodies would be possible. But we're not hearing a story that she has had any hallucinations. She doesn't report any tremors. And, and we'll take a look at her neurological exam. Okay, so here's your next polling question. What sort of cognitive tests would you expect to see scores below normal for age and level of education for this patient? Word recall, animals, where she has to name as many animals she can in one minute. Calculations, you're gonna ask her how many nickels in a dollar or how many quarters in 675 or clock draw. So hopefully you would have picked the clock draw because that would be visual spatial and perhaps calculations that actually can localize to a dominant parietal lobe. So here's her bedside testing and here's um, her neurological exam. So when we tested her for visual field testing, she had inconsistent answers. So sometimes she could see in a certain field and other times she couldn't see the number of fingers you were presenting in that field. So she didn't have a frank neglect, but she was inconsistent. So with regard to memory, she was able to encode a five element name and address without a problem. And five minute after five minute delay, she could recall five or five elements spontaneously. With regard to language testing, she named 22 animals and 13 vegetables. And she also named 20 F words. So that's very good semantic and phonemic language testing. Now she did have simultaneous agnosia where we showed her NAVON letters. So she was able to appreciate the small letters, but unable to appreciate the larger global figures. So in other words, she could see the letter A, but she couldn't identify the large E. And here she could see the letter E, but couldn't identify the large A. So she had a calculia. So she was unable to give you the number of nickels in a dollar or the number of quarters in $6.75. And look at her clock draw. So she clearly had some visual spatial problems on clock draw, and this is her Benson's figure. Additionally, we asked her to describe the cookie thief picture, and she said the boy was leaning backwards and the mother was making breakfast. So she seemed to be having some trouble really seeing the detail. The remainder of her neurological exam was normal, so we didn't find Parkinsonian signs and symptoms for her. So you're right, we would put her into the occipital temporal occipital parietal network, with vision and object recognition are probably her highest problems. And we would expect that MRI, if she has the posterior cortical atrophy, to have a parietal occipital or occipital temporal atrophy in greater proportion to the rest of the cortex. And we would expect that perhaps that posterior cingulate gyrus is involved. And I'll explain to you what that is momentarily. So let's review some pertinent anatomy for imaging first before we look at her imaging. So we have the frontal pole, we have the occipital pole, the most posterior aspect of the occipital lobe, and we have the temporal pole, the most anterior aspect of the temporal pole. So right here, you see we have an axial MRI and we're at the level of the pons. So you'll learn to recognize that when the brainstem is shaped like this, you're about at the level of the pons, about midway through. So you can remember P for pons and P for poles. So at this particular level, you can be looking at the temporal poles on the right, temporal pole on the left, and they both look quite full. This is all temporal lobe on the right, all temporal lobe on the left, and we have a occipital lobe in the posterior aspect. And this is some of the cerebellum receding away. Now to review the brain stem, we have the medulla, pons, and midbrain. 
shown for you here, medulla, pons, and midbrain on these axial MRIs. So at the level of the medulla, we only are looking at cerebellum. As we scroll superiorly, we're going to see the pons come in and eventually that pons will take this shape. When the pons takes this shape, we're right about here midway through. And remember P for pons and P for poles. We have a right and left temporal pole. We have a right temporal lobe, left temporal lobe, occipital lobe in the posterior aspect and some of the cerebellum. As we continue to scroll superiorly, we're going to see the brain stem change to the shape of the midbrain. The shape of the midbrain looks like a butterfly. It's associated with cerebral crews, which are large white matter tracts going to and from the cortex. At the level of the midbrain, we wanna notice the right hippocampus and the left hippocampus. Their medial temporal lobe structures, very important to us in dementia. Now, I mentioned the cingulate gyrus being involved in posterior cortical atrophy, but uninvolved in a Lewy body's dementia. So the cingulate gyrus is comprised of frontal, parietal, and wraps around and picks up on the medial temporal lobe. So if you picked up this, this temporal lobe here and you looked underneath inside, that's the medial temporal lobe. So here we have a sagittal cut, and you can see the cingulate gyrus colored in green. So it is a medial structure, just lateral to the brain stem and the thalamus and basal ganglia. So you have a right and a left cingulate gyrus. So comprised of the frontal, the parietal, and wraps around on the medial temporal lobe. And you can see this red structure here is a cartoon drawing of the hippocampus, and the green is the parahippocampal gyrus. So on an MRI sagittal view, the cingulate gyrus is here, so comprised of frontal, parietal, and we can't see the medial temporal because that's been cut off this picture. Now this, this sulci or sulcus that I'm actually outlining here is the cingulate sulcus. The cingulate sulcus makes a hard right angle turn right between the frontal and parietal lobes. And this is called the posterior cingulate sulcus. And between the occipital and parietal lobe, we'll have a parietal occipital sulcus. And so the parietal lobe that's midline has a special name called the precuneus. So now to recognize parietal atrophy, we could use a scoring system called the CODEM scoring system, which are the numbers you're seeing here. The system goes from zero to three. So zero means there's no parietal atrophy. So the posterior cingulate sulcus here is a normal width and the parietal occipital sulcus is also normal. And as we look at an axial view, you can eyeball this and you're about half frontal and half parietal. And this is a normal appearing parietal sulci. As we move to a CODEM score of one, the posterior cingulate sulcus is widened a little bit and so is the parietal occipital sulcus. And as you're looking at the axial view, you can appreciate here that the intraparietal sulci is a little bit wider compared to the frontal sulci. Now a CODEM score of one is actually normal in elderly patients. As the, as the atrophy of the parietal lobe progresses, you'll see a widening of the posterior cingulate sulcus like this. Again, a widening of the parietal occipital sulcus and you'll see atrophy of the precuneus. So you can see a widened intraparietal sulcus right here. And at the axial view, it's very clear that the intraparietal sulci is quite a bit more apparent than the sulci of the frontal lobe. And a quotum score of three, we have a knife blade parenchyma with an extremely wide posterior cingulate sulcus, an extremely wide parietal occipital sulcus, and really the parietal lobe is, is almost obliterated, the left worse than the right. So now here is our patient from the vignette one, their MRI. So this patient has, we can recognize we're at the level of the pons. So we have right temporal, left temporal, occipital, and you can appreciate here that the sulci in the temporal and occipital lobe is a little bit wider as on the left as compared to the right. 
As we scroll superiorly, we'll see the brain stem change to the shape of the midbrain. It looks like a butterfly. And then we can see very chunky sulci in temporal lobe and occipital lobe. So we have an atrophy in bilateral occipital lobes and also a left temporal lobe. And as we scroll superiorly, now we have a slice right about here. So we're above the temporal lobe. And when we're taking a slice here, we can appreciate that half of our slice is frontal, half of our slice is parietal. So right about here, we divide about halfway. This is frontal lobe, this is parietal lobe, and we can clearly see that we have much more significant atrophy in the parietal lobe left worse than the right. So if our MRI was equivocal, which obviously that one was not, we might win an order in FDG, FDG PET. So the FDG PET is a glucose analog tagged with a radio tracer. It will be taken up in normal healthy cells and it won't be taken up well where there's neurodegeneration. So here, the pets look like this, they're a little bit fuzzy. We can look at the uptake in bright white or dark black. So this uptake is represented in bright, bright white. So this area here is sort of a giveaway that we're at the orbital frontal gyrus. So we would know at that level, we're looking at the brain stem kind of towards the midbrain and we have a right, temporal lobe, a left temporal lobe, a occipital lobe, and a posterior aspect. And here we have a very obvious hypometabolism in the left temporal lobe and left occipital lobe. You can see it's grayer, it's less bright white compared to the right side. As we scroll superiorly, we can eyeball this about half frontal, half parietal. And if you look very closely, we have a lot of nice bright white uptake in the cortex in the frontal lobe compared to sort of gray and, and dull here in the left parietal lobe and also in the left parietal in the right parietal lobe. This is the posterior cingulate gyrus. And the posterior cingulate gyrus is a little bit involved here. And we can tell because this is a little bit grayer and duller compared to the bright white uptake over here. So we have the posterior parietal lobe with, with hypometabolism and we have the posterior cingulate gyrus involved. So we have a diagnosis, it's posterior cortical atrophy for this patient. And we would expect that there would be an Alzheimer's disease pathology. And the way we knew that is that FDG PET would have had um, no involvement at all in the posterior cingulate gyrus. And that has a special name for, um, it's called the cingulate island sign. And we see that in a dementia of Lewy bodies. So if the patient was very early and it was, we knew they had visual spatial problems and it was a little bit hard to tell that perhaps they don't have hallucinations yet. And we were kind of in between the PCA or the DLB, the FDG PET can be very helpful to make the difference. Now here's clinical vignette two. So this is a 75 year old right-handed male. He presents with memory problems for two years. He has 18 years of education. He has a master's in civil engineering and he worked for Cigna for 30 years. He retired two years ago and memory was contributory. So per his wife, he forgets something said within 10 minutes. He misplaces items more, he repeats often, he searches for words frequently and sometimes he substitutes wrong words without self-correction. He missed a few doctor's appointments he was late paying bills, so his wife is assisting with appointments and monitoring the bill pay, but he's still doing most of the task himself. He continues to complete minor electrical plumbing and carpentry repairs pretty well, but they take him a little bit longer. He's still managing his own meds, cooks simple meals, and helps with laundry. He seems a little less sure of himself driving, so he stays close to home. And he's been a little more anxious and angers a little more easily. So now listening to his story, which one of the four functional cognitive systems would you put him in? So that would be our first polling question. So hopefully you picked medial temporal limbic network because the wife's biggest complaint was that he forgets something said a few minutes later. He seems to have a little bit of executive dysfunctioning and that he's having some trouble with the bills and the appointments, but he's still doing that himself. 
So what would be your top differential diagnoses? Alzheimer's disease and MCI and or MCI driven by Alzheimer's, a behavioral variant FTD, or one of the PPAs, logopenic semantic, or dementia buoy bodies. So hopefully you picked A, Alzheimer's disease and MCI, and then I would challenge you to try to figure out why would you put him in one category versus the other? So the answer to that is the Alzheimer's disease is telling us that he's at a dementia level. And the MCI mild cognitive impairment is telling us that he's mild, mildly impaired, but he's still able to take care of himself. So the fact that he could still um, do a lot of things, he could still do his carpentry work, he was still managing his meds, he's having some trouble with appointments and finances, but he's still doing them. At the point when he can no longer do those things, we would call him at a dementia level of impairment. Okay, so here's his testing. His MOCA score was 26 out of 30, and he lost all four on word recall. He was able to encode only three of five of the five element address. So when we gave him the address, he was only able to say three of those things. After a five minute delay, he could only recall one part of that five element address. And even when we gave him multiple choices, he could only bring back two. So that tells us that he's not laying down those memories. And it's sort of a classic appearance of the cognitive testing for, an, for something being driven by Alzheimer's disease or the medial temporal limbic network. So he was able to correctly recognize 15 of 20 words on the word list. So that's a little bit of a giveaway too. So he was presented with a word list three times and then he was asked to see how many he could recall. And then he was asked to tell how, then he was shown 20, 10 were actually on the list and 10 were not on the list. And he really couldn't even bring back which ones were on that list by looking at them or recognizing them. So oftentimes with a vascular dementia where vascular disease is primary, the patient will recognize all of those words. In contrast to an Alzheimer's patient who will have deficits recognizing because he's never laid the memory down. So this patient was able to name 13 F words which is a phonemic fluency and 10 animals, which is a semantic fluency. So another giveaway is when semantic fluency is worse than phonemic fluency. That's another giveaway that this is a temporal limbic pattern. So with the Boston naming test where the patient is shown pictures and asked to identify the pictures, he did fairly well. He named 28 out of 30. And on the trails B, where we asked the patient to draw from one to A, two to B, three to C, et cetera. So it requires some set changing, some executive functioning, some, some memory. And the patient did uh, in the low normal range. So this is one of our best tests to tell if the patient should be, should be formally tested with a driver evaluation. So all other scores were in normal limits and his neurological exam was unremarkable, which is what we would expect with an Alzheimer's disease. So we would put this patient into the medial temporal limbic network where memory and learning was the primary presenting problems. And our differentials would be the Alzheimer's dementia or MCI with an AED etiology. And we've already discussed how we would separate out those two. The Alzheimer's dementia the patient is dependent on someone else really to take care of them, to do their finances, to do their appointments, to manage their medications, et cetera. With an MCI, the patient is still able to do those things. Now that MRI, we would expect to have a medial temporal lobe atrophy in greater proportion and a posterior parietal cortical atrophy. So also on a sequence of MRI called SWI or GRE, we may look for microhemorrhages or something called superficial siderosis. So here's a review of pertinent anatomy to take a look at this patient's MRI. Again, we remember the medulla, pons, and midbrain. We remember at the level of the medulla, we're looking at cerebellum. At the level of the pons, we want to pay close attention to the poles, the anterior temporal poles, and the posterior occipital poles. And also at the level of the midbrain, we want to pay close attention to the right hippocampus and the left hippocampus.
Now we're going to look a little bit closer at the hippocampi. So this is a cartoon picture showing you that if we are towards the medial aspect of the brain, so you're just lateral to the brain stem, you have the medial temporal lobe where the hippocampus is housed. The hippocampus is a relatively long structure with the head, the body, and the tail. So this axial view is taking a slice along the long axis. So we can see the head, the body, and the tail of the right hippocampus, head, body, tail of the left hippocampus. This is a little piece of the temporal horn, and this is a little piece of the atrium, which is also an area of the lateral ventricles. When this hippocampus body atrophies and becomes quite small, we see a lot of cerebral spinal fluid filling up these lateral ventricle. We'll see the temporal horn widen, we'll see the atrium widen, and also we can sometimes look for another structure called the collateral sulcus that's around in this area but not appreciated well on this slide. So our best view to look at hippocampi is the coronal view. So on the coronal view, we're going to pay attention to a few structures. The choroid fissure, labeled here, the temporal horn would be positioned here, the height of the body of the hippocampus, and also that collateral sulcus, which can be seen here. So this is the parahippocampal gyrus. This is the hippocampal body itself. So we're going to look at those structures. The choroid fissure will widen, and then it will coalesce with the temporal horn. And also we may see a widening collateral sulcus as the parahippocampal gyrus atrophies. So let's review your parietal atrophy again. Again, we wanna pay close attention to the posterior cingulate sulcus and the occipital parietal sulcus. We wanna pay attention to the intraparietal sulci on the axial view. And then we wanna look for the widening of those two sulci and widening of the intraparietal sulcus. So now here's the MRI for clinical vignette two. So this is a 75 year old man. And we have at the level of the pons, just when the midbrain and cerebral crews are starting to show, we have the right hippocampus and the left hippocampus. And we can see that the temporal horns are quite wide here on either side. One slice superiorly, we can see the midbrain clearly and we can see how thin the hippocampal bodies are. And then on, as we scroll superiorly, we can eyeball this about half is frontal, half is parietal, and we can clearly see that the intraparietal sulci is more wide compared to the frontal sulci. And as we continue to move superiorly, we can continue to appreciate the parietal cortical atrophy even more. On the coronal view, we have the right hippocampus here, left hippocampus here, choroid fissure and temporal horn have coalesced and we see quite a bit of cerebral spinal fluid. And we can also appreciate the atrophied hippocampus on the next slide. Here's the PET scan. So this PET scan is going to have the glucose analog taken up in a dark black. So here we have, this it looks like we're about at the level of the pons by the shape of the brainstem. So we have a right temporal lobe, left temporal lobe, a occipital lobe, and a posterior aspect. If you look closely, you can see how dark and how good the uptake here is in the occipital lobes. And you can see how grayed out this uptake is in the temporal lobe. And it's a little bit worse on the left side. See how it extends further down towards the occipital lobe. And as we are at a, superior, a more superior view, we can eyeball this, we're about half frontal and half bridal. And look how good the dark black uptake is here in the frontal lobes and how little uptake you have here in the parietal lobes, especially in the left parietal lobe. So we have a hypometabolism in the, in the posterior parietal lobes, left greater than right. We have a hypometabolism bilaterally in the temporal lobes with left greater than right. So this patient fits into the medial temporal limbic network. Memory and learning was the primary problem presented. And the MRI had a medial temporal lobe atrophy and posterior parietal cortical atrophy. And the FDG PET had hypometabolism in the same area.
Now we're going to take a quick look at the microhemorrhages. So microhemorrhages, depending on where they're positioned, can lend to the idea that the patient has an underlying cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So in other words, they have amyloid in their vessels or surrounding the vessels. So if the microhemorrhages are in the peripheral cortical area, we can attribute that oftentimes, if the clinical picture fits, to a cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Whereas if the microhemorrhages are in what we call deep areas or cerebellum, we typically would feel that that's probably more associated with an uncontrolled hypertension. So on this MRI, we have microhemorrhages bilaterally in the temporal lobe and in the left occipital lobe. And these are cortical peripheral microhemorrhages. So we would attribute them to cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And here we have frontal and parietal lobes just covered with microhemorrhages. And on this slide, we have one microhemorrhage down here in the left, in the right parietal lobe. So what, you should have a few microhemorrhages, but if we had a wonderful clinical story, we may say that we may attribute that to cerebral amyloid apathy, angiopathy if we had a beautiful story for a medial temporal limbic pattern. So in contrast to this MRI, the hemorrhages are in deep areas. This is basal ganglia and this is thalami on the right and left. So we would attribute them more to hypertensive microangiopathy. Now we also have something called superficial siderosis. So if you remember, the subarachnoid space has a lot of little vessels in it. If those vessels have cerebral amyloid angiopathy, they can also hemorrhage and the blood will travel around the cell side just like a subarachnoid hemorrhage would. So we can see, so it will look like a little serpentine fashion. And again, we're going to be looking at the GRE or the SWI sequence to pick up any blood products, whether they would be superficial siderosis or whether they would be microhemorrhages. Now here's clinical vignette three. So this is a 56 year old female who presented with personality change, which began about four years ago. She was an emergency room RN for 30 years and she recently had an extramarital affair with a male patient whom she treated for a dislocated finger and she found him irresistible, which resulted in her termination. So per her husband, she openly criticized their daughter-in-law for being overweight and told her husband to shut up when they were out with dinner with friends. And this is not like her personality. She's been preoccupied with Starbucks cold brews, consuming three or four large beverages a day. And she spent about $5,000 on Amazon in the last three months, um, stockpiling cleaning products, paper towels, and toilet paper in her basement. She refused to go to her son's basketball games, explaining that she's never liked sports and she's never enjoyed their games anyway. And she doesn't really have much of a problem recalling recent events, cooking, driving, shopping. She's managing meds and appointments well. So cognitively, she seems to do pretty well, but personality and behavior is really quite strikingly unusual. So which of the four main functional cognitive systems would you put this patient into? So hopefully you pick the frontal temporal network for behavior, executive, and attention. So executive and attention, we would expect to come up on her cognitive testing. So what would be your top differential diagnoses here? Behavioral variant, Alzheimer's disease, behavioral variant, FTD, local penic, PPA, semantic PPA, or dementia Lewy bodies. So hopefully you picked A and B, behavioral variant of Alzheimer's disease and behavioral variant of FTD. So let's take a look at her testing. Oh, so actually we're going to put her into the functional cognitive system of frontal temporal network because behavior is the most striking. And generally um, out of the two differentials that we have, behavioral variant FTD is more common than behavioral variant Alzheimer's disease. Not that there could ever be some misdiagnosis, of course there could be, but oftentimes when the story is so profoundly perfect like this, um, we don't even need imaging to support that. But if we did have imaging, we would expect a frontal or anterior temporal atrophy to be in greater proportion to the rest of the cortex 
and we would expect the FDG PET to show hypometabolism in the corresponding areas. So this was a really nice table that was in the continuum um, that gave you the criteria for the diagnosis for behavioral variant FTD. And you can see that in our vignette, the patient had pretty much everything. Behavioral disinhibition. She was saying rude things to her daughter-in-law and to her husband. She had apathy. She didn't want to go to the games. She had a loss of empathy. She told the kids she didn't even care about the games anymore. She was compulsive and had ritualistic behavior with the Starbucks and the hoarding, the, the toiletries and the cleaning supplies, the dietary changes in the Starbucks. Um, and so, and they, I circled the imaging here for you. Again, a frontal and or anterior temporal atrophy and a frontal and or anterior temporal hyperperfusion on the pet. So the pertinent anatomy that we wanna look at is the frontal temporal atrophy. So here, if you take a good look at the sulci, generally the parietal sulci is a little bit wider than the frontal, but you can appreciate that she seems to be a little bit wider here versus on the right frontal lobe versus the left, and you can appreciate it better on the flare. So this is a T2 and this is a flare image. So you can see that the sulci in the right frontal lobe is quite wide compared to the left frontal lobe. And a little caveat is for the out medial temporal limbic problems, the out driven by Alzheimer's disease, generally the left is worse than the right, as you saw with the left temporal and the left uh, parietal lobes. But with a behavioral variant FTD, generally the right is affected more than the left. So this is a coronal view. And when you're doing a coronal view, the first few slices that come in are all frontal lobe. So this is a great way to look at the frontal pole. And you can see really well by looking at this view that she clearly has frontal atrophy. And out on the right, much worse than on the left. And here is the coronal view a little bit um, closer where you're taking a look at the medial temporal lobe area. This is a right temporal lobe. This is a left temporal lobe hippocampus on the right and on the left. She has actually a little bit of hippocampal atrophy and you can see frontal atrophy. So she has frontal temporal atrophy. So clinical vignette four, we have a 69 year old male who presents with memory problems for one year. His past medical history is notable for high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, cholecystectomy one year ago. He has 19 years of education. He was a JD and he owned his own law firm. He retired, retired at 63 with no memory problems at all. The story his wife gives is that all his problems started after he had anesthesia because of his gallbladder being removed about a year ago. He had a very long post-op delirium. And since his surgery, as soon as he came home, he could not manage meds, appointments or finances. She had to completely take them over. She reports that some days he almost seemed like his old self and then other days he became very confused again and he goes back and forth. He's agitated easily and more easily angered. And he has never helped with cooking and cleaning or laundry. He's gotten lost driving on several occasions, even in familiar areas. And he says he sees children playing in the house at night. And on one occasion, he thought his wife was a friend and didn't seem to recognize her. He talks in his sleep and flails his arms and legs around and he hit his wife on a few occasions. He's a little less balanced with walking and he has two falls in the last three months. He's not shuffling and he has no tremors. So here's his testing. So his mocha was 14 out of 30. He lost points for the cube drawing, the clock and trails. He also lost points for digits, naming and abstraction. He, uh, a craft story is when we read a story and we ask the person to give us back sort of parts of that story. So he was impaired on the craft story, which is a representation of memory. His F words were seven, his animals were 13. So his phonemic fluency was worse than his semantic fluency, opposite than the temporal limbic pattern that we looked at for Alzheimer's. His digits forward and backwards were impaired. That's an attention test and especially the backwards. His trails A was very slow. That's when we ask him to go from one to two to three to four. 
He was 1.5 standard deviations below normal for age and level of education. He timed out on trails B, so he had a very hard time doing it. And I can show you that set changing and some executive functioning or dysfunctioning. He had trouble with clock and Benson figure. So his clock is pretty profound and his Benson figure is, is really impaired. So on neurological exam, he had upper extremity cogwheeling right greater than left. His gait was bradykinetic. He was slightly hunched and it had reduced arm swing. So all of this is telling you he's Parkinsonian. His stride length and base were normal and he wasn't shuffling, but he probably will be shuffling a little later on. So which of the four main functional cognitive systems do you think he best fits? You probably can identify him as a dementia Lewy body it's pretty easily, but hallucinations are pretty much a dead giveaway and the Parkinsonian signs and symptoms. So here's the fourth consensus criteria for a clinical diagnosis of dementia Lewy bodies. So he has deficits in attention and executive function and visual spatial on his cognitive testing as our patient did. And if you look at the core features here, he had fluctuations in cognition. Remember she said on some days he was his old self, on other days he was completely confused. So that's a little bit of a, a giveaway for you. He has the recurrent hallucinations, sees the people in the house, and not recognizing his wife is called the cat breast delusion. So he had the REM behavior sleep disorder. He was flailing around and hit his wife and fell out of bed. And he had the Parkinsonian signs and symptoms on exam. So we put him into the occipital temporal, occipital parietal network. Vision and object recognition would be most impaired on his testing. And that MRI can very often be very normal. So sometimes we go to a pet and we look for that posterior cingulate sign where the posterior cingulate gyrus will be spared in contrast to being involved in the, in the Alzheimer's disease. So here's his MRI. We're at the level about at the midbrain, just above the pons. So we have full temporal lobes on right and left and full occipital lobes. As we move superiorly, frontal lobes are coming in full, right temporal, left temporal, occipital. And as we scroll superiorly, we're now looking at about half frontal and half parietal, and he has terrific looking full cortex. And on his coronal view, he has very nice full hippocampi. So he looks quite normal. So we went and did a pet for him. And here I'm showing you the pet with a bright white uptake. And I inverted it to show you the dark black uptake. So this is the same slice, just inverted. So here, if we look at the bright white uptake, we have relatively good uptake in the frontal lobes. And we have a decreased uptake in the parietal lobe. But look at that posterior cingulate gyrus. It just has a wonderful, super great uptake. And we call this the cingulate islet sign. And that's going to be a hallmark for dementia bluey bodies. If we invert that, so the uptake is dark black, we see a very good dark black uptake in the frontal lobe. We see a decreased uptake in the parietal lobes bilaterally. And we see the cingulate island sign with a very dark black uptake here. So he is the occipital temporal occipital parietal network. He had visual hallucinations and visual, visual impairment on his testing. That MRI is often normal. The FDG pet with a hypometabolism in the areas that we would expect, the posterior parietal lobe, posterior occipital lobe with a cingulate island sign. Now, in summary, the four functional cognitive systems along with their imaging. So we have first medial temporal limbic network, memory and learning will be the most significant impairment. We'll think of Alzheimer's disease and MCI being driven by Alzheimer's etiology. The MRI would be expected to have a medial temporal lobe and posterior parietal cortical atrophy with maybe microhemorrhages or superficial siderosis on the SW or GRA. With the occipital, the second functional cognitive system is occipital temporal occipital parietal network, where we would expect vision and object recognition to be the most impaired. And the MRI for posterior cortical atrophy 
would be parietal occipital temporal atrophy with a posterior cingulate gyrus involved, in contrast to the dementia of Lewy bodies with the MRI often normal, or we may have occipital parietal atrophy and we'll see that posterior cingulate gyrus spared, hence the posterior cingulate island or the cingulate island sign on the FDG PET. The third functional cognitive system is frontal temporal network, where we have behavior, usually the most prominent symptom, and perhaps executive and attention dysfunction. We have two differentials that we'll put into that cognitive system, behavioral variant Alzheimer's disease and behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia, with the latter being the more common. The MRI would be frontal temporal atrophy and imaging with microhemorrhages would lend to the behavioral variant of Alzheimer's disease, whereas frontal temporal dementia, sometimes the story is so good, we don't need any imaging at all. And now the Perry-Sylvian language network, we didn't talk about very much because we have a whole lecture on PPAs and how to differentiate the diagnoses using bedside testing coming up in August next month. So the Perry-Sylvian language network, again, language would be the primary symptom presenting and the most prominent symptom at the beginning of the disease. We have three variants, a local penic PPA, a semantic PPA, and an aglomatic non-flowing PPA. Each of them will have different appearing MRIs. The local penic typically driven by amyloid plaques and tail tangles, one of the variants of Alzheimer's disease. The semantic with that classic MRI appearance of anterior temporal polar atrophy, left greater than right. And the agromatic non-fluent PPA will have sort of a classic presentation where the patient will have abnormal sentence structure and syntax. Okay, so there's my references. And um, typically I would ask questions, but this recording is, is not being done live. But I do wanna again, encourage you to go to our website and sign up for the primary progressive aphasia, diagnosis and bedside testing that's going to be presented on August 18th, 2021. Okay, so thank you so much. And I wanna say goodbye to everybody.